want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, thank you for your patience in walking through this with me, this material. I'm so grateful. Uh, it's changing my life. And I appreciate you uh, uh, having revival and praying and uh, coming and setting an atmosphere in which God can speak to me, change my life. So thank you. Thank you for your input. So we're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2. We want to begin reading again at verse 1 and read down through verse 11 uh, to give you the flow of it. Uh, Paul is writing, and what a statement. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interest, but to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Wow. You cannot think like Jesus without being in Jesus, and you cannot be in Jesus without thinking like Jesus. So obviously the key is to be in Jesus and Jesus in you. Now the difficulty with that, I think, in my, uh, my own personal life and growing up, I didn't understand what it was to be in Jesus. You understand in the Old Testament, God was always over there and I'm over here. And of course, he's telling me what to do. And he does it in bold ways. He comes down on Mount Sinai, yells and screams at me, thunder, lightning, scares me half to death, gives me a whole list of things that I'm supposed to do. And I say, hey, I'm trying, don't look so close. If I wanted to follow God in the Old Testament, it was easy to do because, hey, there he is in a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. So I know where he's going and when I go to McDonald's to get coffee I'm not following because he didn't stop it was kind of cut and dry you know it was kind of easy because God was over there and I'm over here and who's going to pull this off I've got to pull this off but see you come into the New Testament and this new covenant thing and it's a radical overwhelming difference God is no longer over there. He's come to be within here. But note this, he's not come to be in here like he's over there. See, when he was over there, what was he doing? Telling me what to do. He's not come in here to tell me what to do. He might as well have stayed over there. If that's all he's going to do is tell me what to do. When he was over there, he was telling me what to do. Has he come in here to tell me what to do? No. No. For again, he could have stayed over there and done the same thing. Well, why has he come in here? He's come in here to do it. There is a relational involvement that's going on now because he has literally come within my flesh. And I'm a Christian tonight. <laughs> Probably surprised you, didn't I? I'm a Christian tonight. And you know how I know I'm a Christian tonight? Because I got two people living inside this body. Now, I know I'm not much, but you better look out for the left hook, brother. I'm telling you, he is powerful. And I am all wrapped up in him, and he is all wrapped up in me, and there's some kind of a relational involvement going on here. It's interesting, study Acts chapter 2, and he uses in four, in four verses, he lays out the whole Pentecost event. And in the four verses, he uses the word filled three times. But the interesting thing is, two of those times, it's two different Greek words. In other words, he uses two different Greek words, and each time we translate it filled, and properly so. One of the Greek words means filled in terms of, here's a container, and here's content. You take the content, you put it into the container. Take the content, put it into the container. Content into the, oh, the, con the container is filled. He uses that word for us in terms of Pentecost. 
He says, you know what's happened? I'm a container. And what's the content? God is the content. And God has literally come and entered into the container and filled me with himself. But then as he begins to think about it, he changes words for the filled idea. And this other word for filled has the idea not just of a container. It is a container. But it's not just a container. Well, it is a container. But it's not just a container. And there is content. But it's not just content. And the co content just isn't in the container. It's the idea of sponge. Hoo-hoo! <laughs> that's a different ball game, isn't it? Because that's a saturation, see? That's an involvement where, whoa, all over me, everywhere I am. I got interested in DNA. I know all about DNA because I watch CSI. <laughs> so I'm an expert. Uh, DNA, do you know that DNA is all over me? It's in my spit. It's in my snot. It's in my sweat. Scrape my hand. It's in my skin particles. It's underneath my toes. My whole being is filled with my DNA, my hair. Everything about me has my DNA. And the DNA is the deciding factor of my existence. Wouldn't it be something if Jesus would become my DNA? Every attitude I have, oh, he's the shaper of it. He's the cause of it. He's the reason I do it. He's the blame. You know why I look like I look? I can't help it. It's my DNA, Jesus. <laughs> he determines my action. He's, I'm just so wrapped up everywhere in my whole system. He just permeated my whole being. See, this was involved in the idea that Jesus said, eat of my flesh, drink my blood. What on earth is he talking about? Do you know the early Christians were, were, were criticized for being cannibals? Because they were all always talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. What are you talking about? We're talking about digesting Jesus into our whole system. We're talking about taking him in, allowing him to come in, and so digest into our system that he flows into every cell of our being. And we live. He's our nutrition. He's the way we act. He's the, he's the total. We're in such intimate. See, that's a total involvement. See, that's not Jesus over there telling me what to do. That's not Jesus being my counselor and giving me advice and I try to follow it. That's not Jesus, my boss, giving me orders and I'm trying to pull it off. See, that's a whole different deal. That's Jesus literally causing me. That's what Paul's talking about. He says, here's what I want for you. Verse five. I want you to have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This DNA, this mind structure, this thought process, this perspective, this nature that dwells in the person of Jesus, all that he is in the fiber of his being is God. I want you to have that in you. And I want his mind and your mind to come together. And I want you to think like he thinks. And I want you to want what he wants. And I want you, he's not a counselor, again, giving you advice. He's not your boss telling what you do. He's literally come and you begin to feel like him, think like him, walk like him, you act like him like him you become a demonstration of him because you're in this 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 merger with him so I want you to have this nature well what is this nature like well he describes it we've gone over this every night but let's look at that again he says it's encouragement first verse if there is any encouragement and you'll remember that's the moving resource of the nature of God literally producing something in your life so what is his resource producing in your life it's these gigantic fingers that have literally reached into your existence and it's enhancing you it's building you it's encouraging you it's strengthening you it's making you causing you shaping you that's his nature that's the way he is that's what he wants to do 
And you say, well, what is that nature? He says, it's the comfort from love. So at the core of God's life is this love thing, this agape thing that we've been talking about, this selfless, self-sacrificing giving of, of yourself. That's the way he is. And that love is always after your benefit, always after strengthening you. It's constantly flowing. So the resource is love and the love is the flow. It's constantly reaching into your life to build and shape and, and strengthen and enhance and produce his destiny that he's dreamed for you. How deep is this in the very essence of God? He calls it affection, which is the gut, <laughs> the bowels. Down deep in the, the bowels of God. If you slice God down the middle and crawl down to the very core of his existence, that's what's there. And it flows out of his whole life. And it's in, God is incapable of doing anything that's anti this nature. Wow. I want you to have that mind. And you can't have that mind because it only exists in him. Therefore, you've got to be in him or you can't have that mind. You can't think like that. That can't be unless you get into this relational involvement. Unless you're filled. Now, he does give the contrasting picture, you remember, that if you're not filled with this nature, what are you filled with? The demonic nature. <laughs> which is the grab, get, demand, protect, and always think about yourself. So over here is the nature of God, which is bleed, suffer, and die, and never think about yourself. And over here is grab, get, demand, protect, and always think about yourself. And you've got one or the other. And I want the nature of God to dwell in you. Then he stops and says, oh, what would this look like if that's happened in my life? What would it look like has anybody ever seen this? He says, I'm going to give you an example. Jesus. And he starts in verse 6. And we dealt with this last night. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And we tried to establish last night, Jesus is God. Not a little God, not kind of God, not one third God, not once in a while God, not, hey, he was God, but isn't God now. No, he's always God. Every time you see Jesus, he's God. He's God at creation. He's God at the crucifixion. God when he walks on the water. God when he comes back the second time. Jesus is plain flat God. And when you say Jesus, you're really saying God. And when you say God, you're really saying Jesus because Jesus is God. He's all God, not part God. He's totally God. Everything God is, Jesus is. Do you know how important that is? Because if Jesus is not God, then the cross, folks, is another death of another nice guy. Lots of nice guys died, but it didn't change my life. The reason the cross that we're moving into on Good Friday, the reason the cross is so significant is because oh, God is dying. Because Jesus is God. So he establishes, which we tried to do last night, this overwhelming reality that Jesus, and you'll notice he uses in the verse, and I want to emphasize this, he uses in the verse, though he was in the form of God. And we emphasize that he's not a shape shifter. That is, he doesn't take forms like he's this in this form. Oh, he's a pillar of fire at one time. Oh, he's a, he's a, he's a cloud in the next form. Oh, he's an angel now. He, oh, he, now he's a man. No, that's not what we're dealing with here. The word literally has the idea of objective reality. So Jesus is the objective reality of God. Now, when he gets done with that, Look at this verse. We want to deal with this tonight, which is verse 7. But, <laughs> he just said Jesus is God, but. Now, there is a normal word in the New Testament, Greek, for the conjunction but. This is not it. And it sets up, the normal word for the conjunction but sets up contrast, obviously. You got this over here, but, then there's this over here. This not only is a contrast, but it gives additional information. 
Now that's true with this word that, that is translated but here. But this word that's translated but here is not the normal word. It's Allah. And it's the conjunction but on steroids. In other words, it's his way of yelling at you. So this, what I'm going to say to you is not casual. It's not, well, yeah. Oh, good information, preacher. See, it's not that. What, I, what, I, what I'm going to tell you is so absolutely startling, so off the wall, so whoa. And I don't even know if you'll believe it or not. Well, what is it that's so startling? He emptied himself. Now, I know that you guys are so educated that you're really excited about grammar. So try to contain yourself here. Himself, he emptied himself. He emptied himself. Himself is a direct object. Meaning what? Receives the action of the verb. What's the, action, what's the action of the verb? Emptied. So whatever's going on in the emptied himself, whatever's taking place in the emptied himself, which by the way is the Greek word kenosis, and through the years, this passage is known as the kenosis passage, which means emptied. He emptied. So whatever's going on in the emptied is totally focused on the person of God himself, Jesus. The whole focus is on him, not an angel, not a program, not a style, but it's focused entirely on the person of Jesus himself. He emptied. It's also interesting that the verb is in the active voice. Oh, what does that mean? That means that the subject is responsible for the emptying. So you know who's doing the emptying? He is emptying himself. So God is acting on himself. So this is no one forced him. No one backed him into a corner. No one got him over a barrel. No one began to work on him. God was working on himself. And all that's going on in what he's going to tell us about Jesus, Jesus is doing to himself. Significant. Very significant. He emptied which again is the word kenosis, which means what? He reached inside of himself and pulled out. Set that aside. Reached in, pulled out. Set that aside. Pull, reached in, pulled out. Now he never gave up being God. But folks, you can give up what you have without giving up who you are. And he reached into what he had and pulled out and set aside. Emptied himself. Now follow the verse. He emptied himself by taking. The Greek word for taking is lambano. And every time, well, the majority of times that word is used, which is to take, it always has an aggressive, almost violent context to it in other words Jesus didn't casually said oh yeah well that there was a violent aggressive on purpose movement of God upon himself to get this done that this wasn't casual this wasn't well yeah we'll try it and see if it works it wasn't that kind of a deal this was a radical internal surgery that God was performing on himself and there is this aggressive overwhelming emphasis almost violent idea connected with this by taking, do you see it in the verse? But emptying himself by taking the form of a servant. Oh, the form of a servant? Parallel statement with verse 6. Remember, 
form of God, form of a servant, form of God, not a shape shifter, not just an appearance of, but objective reality. So if he's in the objective reality of who God is, form of God, objective reality of being God, he is also the objective reality of being a servant. Isn't it interesting he used the word servant? What you understand is really slave. What you understand is the Greek word doulos, which is really the picture of a galley ship slave. It's the guy who's in this great big ship, a sail ship, and he, when, the sa- when the wind isn't blowing, they have these guys down on the bottom, two on this bench, two on this bench, two on this bench, same over here, an oar sticking through, chains running through everybody, a, 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 be- a, a drummer boy up at the front beating the rhythm, a guy walking down the main aisle cracking the whip, and they are rowing in time. They are slaves. They don't call in and say, well, I feel sick today. They, they don't say, I'm taking the day off today. I don't like that guy that's sitting beside me. Good night, I'm not coming. Coming back. They are slaves. They are people without rights. Somebody someplace has a piece of paper with their name recorded down at the courthouse and they are slaves. Jesus became a slave? Now he's going to develop that. So don't get sidetracked. So he says he became in the objective reality of a slave. Being born. I don't like that translation very well. It's literally the word genomai, which is come into being. Because Jesus, while he, he entered into the experience of conception, don't get the idea that there was any sexual involvement here. This is not God having relationship with a young maid, named Mary, and out pops Jesus. See, if you want that, there are real religions that'll give you that. But that's not here. Jesus is God, which means he always has been. So this is not somebody who's just starting, folks. This is somebody who's always been, who is now entering into the experience of becoming a slave. Really important. So as you move into this, he's being born in the likeness of men. Oh, that's a phenomenal statement. In the likeness of men. Did you note it's plural? In the likeness of men, not in the likeness of man. In other words, God didn't say, oh, I think I'll go down there and become like man. Like, oh, he's got my big nose. Woo! He's got my blue eyes. He took on my DNA, my fingerprint. No, no, no. He had his own. This is really important. He had his own DNA. He had his own fingerprints. Remember Wednesday, or Sunday night we talked to you about how unique you are because your fingerprints are not like anybody else's. Your DNA is not like anybody else's. Nobody looks like you. Look in the mirror, brother. You're one weird dude. We would label you as strange because you are unique. Jesus became not like you, not your DNA. He had his own DNA. He had his own fingerprints. He had his own looks and he had his own destiny. When we talk about being like Jesus, my destiny, folks, is not to die on a cross and win a world. That's not my destiny. That was his. There is a unique destiny for you. And it's not his destiny, it's your destiny. There is divine purpose in your creation. There was divine purpose in him becoming a slave. Now, what we've entered into is what we call the incarnation, which, of course, is not powder you put in your milk. The incarnation literally means coming, becoming flesh. 
The doctrine of the incarnation is, listen close, God leaped off of his throne and assumed the body and nature of man. And in one person, one person, there was the total nature of God and the total nature of man in an indissoluble union. Now, I'm going to be at the back door after the service is over and you're going to have to quote this in order to get out of here. So let me give it to you again. God leaped off of his throne and assumed the body and nature of man. And in one person, there was the total nature of God and the total nature of man in an indissoluble union. Indissoluble, what do you mean by that? You can't slice it. You can't divide it. You can't find it. And yet it's there. You can't dissolve it. Let me give you an example of that. Here he stands, handsome young man. Here she stands, beautiful young lady. <gasps> Standing in between them is the indissoluble union called kid, child. Do you know, she, he can get mad and say, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm gone, man. I'm taking my half and leaving. She can get all of a sense. I'll just take my half and go too. You can leave, but you can't take your half. <laughs> Because you can't even find your half. It's an indissoluble union. God, think about this. God leaped off his throne and assumed the body and nature of man. And in one person, there was the total nature of God and the total nature of man in an indissoluble union. What's that mean? You can't slice it. That means he didn't flip in and flip out. That, that, that means, oh, he's walking on the water. Woo, that's his God coming out. Oh, now he's weeping at the grave of Lazarus. That's his manhood. No, no, no. Well, hey, he's God from his waist up, man from his waist down. No, no, no. Well, sometimes he's God. Sometimes Sometimes he's, no, no, no. It's an indissoluble union. And in Paul's terms, what this means is that God reached into his life and pulled out everything that was not compatible with being you. God, Jesus is God, that's right, God, Jesus is God, I know, God, Jesus is God, you said that, get off that, okay, Jesus is God, we got that, God is omnipresent, but nobody here tonight believes that Jesus, born in the womb of Mary, was omnipresent. Do you think he was in every womb in town? Or was he isolated to the womb of Mary? Do you think he was in a dozen mangers at the same time? Or that he was isolated to one manger? When he was in Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, 15 miles, could he turn to his disciples and say, already there? Or did he have to walk like everybody else? Well, but he's God. I know. And now he's not God? No, he's God. But God is omnipresent. I know. But he wasn't as man omnipresent. What did he do with that? He emptied. That's what he's saying, folks. He reached inside of himself and pulled out. See, you can give up what you have. He has omnipresence. He's not omnipresent in nature. That probably isn't a true statement. He, just, he emptied himself. Well, what did he do with that? Well, you didn't know this, but he has this big throne in the sky and right underneath it is a safety deposit box and he put it in there <laughs> and said, hey, it's mine. I'm God, but I'm not going to use it. Why? Because it doesn't fit in with being human. We on track here? 
God is omniscient, all-knowing. I know. Jesus is God. Yeah. He's all-knowing. You're right. But nobody here tonight believes that Jesus, popping out of his mother's womb, the shepherds come up to the, to the manger and go, coochie, coochie, coo. And Jesus looks up at him and in perfect Greek says, what are you doing that for? Nobody here tonight believes that Jesus was born potty trained. You believe that Mary had to come to him and say, oh, Jesus, not again. And then in Luke chapter 2, they said that he came under the control of his parents after the temple thing, you know, and he grew in wisdom. Oh, wait a minute. If you know everything, how can you grow in wisdom? End of Mark, they came up to him. The disciples said, when are you coming back the second time? Jesus said, hmm, don't know. But he's God, I know. God knows everything, I know. But he emptied himself. Safety deposit box. It's mine. I'm not going to use it because it isn't compatible with being like you. Jesus is God. You're right. As God, he's omnipotent. All powerful. Now, wait a minute, preacher. You can't get rid of that one. Look at the miracles he did. We have no idea how many miracles he did. I mean, thousands. Do you know that again and again and again, it says he went into a crowd and healed them all. Thousands of miracles. So you're not going to tell me he's not omnipotent, all powerful. Now, wait a minute. Don't you think it's interesting, folks, that for three, all four Gospels, all four Gospels now, record the fact that for 30 years, the man didn't do anything. No sermons, no preaching, no miracles. I think he coached the Little League team. But outside of that, he didn't do anything. Didn't teach. A carpenter. Living with his mom. Eldest son, taking care of the family. And then all of a sudden, Jesus went crazy. I mean, what would you call it? It's like somebody flipped a switch. And the guy went wild. I mean, all of a sudden, miracles are taking place. And sermons are coming forth. And he's making Pharisees mad. And disciples are gathering around him. And all of this stuff is going on. And you say, whoa, what happened to him? And all four Gospels record or refer to the fact he went down to John, said, John, you're going to baptize me. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. They went down to the water, came out of the water, and had a prayer meeting. And the Father, through the Holy Spirit, filled the man called Jesus. And Jesus didn't do what he did because he's God, although he is God. He did what he did because he was a man filled with God. <laughs> hey, I'm just going to be honest with you. Don't tell anybody this. But I'm going to be honest with you. That is the most irritating idea I've ever heard. You know why? Folks, it eliminates all my excuses. And listen, I've got some good excuses. My dad dropped me twice on my head when I was a kid. That's the reason I am the way I am. I can't help it. Well, you don't have to live with my wife. If you, you'd be like me too. If you had to, well, you don't have to work under my, down at my, see, I've got great excuses for being like I am. But what if, what if everything that was in Jesus, the man, could be in me? 
Now, you may not know this, but in the scriptures, there's two Holy Spirits. There's what we call the dynamite Holy Spirit and the firecracker Holy Spirit. Jesus had the dynamite. I get the firecracker. That's not true. <laughs> there's only one Holy Spirit, folks. And what was roaring inside of Jesus, producing the life of Jesus, See, he's saying, I want to give you an example of having the nature of God in intimacy and oneness. What would that look like? If the nature of God became your DNA, if the nature of God was so in you, if you and him got like a sponge soaked, if you were like a sponge soaked with the nature of God, if you had the mind that God has, the nature of God in you, like well, let me give you an example of what it would be like. Jesus. Jesus. So what excuse am I going to use? Well, again, I've had people abuse me, you know, say things about me. Do you know, and um, I think it's John chapter five, may not be. It's five, six, seven in there someplace. Jesus is engaged with the Pharisees and you know what they do? They look at him and say, at least we know who our dad is. After 30 years, they're still digging up this illegitimate. Mary's pregnant and Joseph isn't. Was he tempted at every point like we've been tempted? Have you ever gone to the extreme of, oh my. Father, forgive them. Well, how was Jesus like that? Well, he's God. Yes, he was God. But that's not the power by which he's operating. He took every advantage he had as God and set it aside and said, I'm not going to have anything over you. Anything that's not compatible with being like you, I'm setting it aside. And he became one of us. I want you to have the nature of God. Oh, this nature of God, which is the nature that says, oh, how can I help you? How can I enhance you? How can I build you? I want this to be at the core of your system, which is the love of God. It's the bleeding, suffering, and dying, and never thinking about yourself. I never want you into the, into the grab, get, demand, protect, and guard, and, and, and always think about yourself thing. I want you in this nature. I want you to, let me give you an example of how it would look. Jesus. Well, preacher, I'm trying. <laughs> you just went over here to the demonic nature. <laughs> Get, grab, demand, protect, guard, always think about yourself. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> you can only have this nature of God. If you do what Jesus did, the son can do nothing of himself. If I would surrender to Jesus like Jesus surrendered to the father, oh, do you know what could happen in my life? Well, manly, okay, wow. God, Jesus is God, I get that. He became a man, but he only was one for 33 years. 
pop back up. Woo! Folks, that isn't what you taught me. You know what you taught me? You taught me that Jesus was raised from the dead as a man. Physical man. Nod your heads, come on. In a physical body. A physical man raised from a, phys from a physical death with a physical body. That's what you taught me. On Easter, you pound that. You taught me that he ascended as a man. And the disciples hung around and said, whoop, there he goes. Have a good trip. And he ascended as a man. And you taught me he's sitting at the right hand of the Father as a man. And you've even taught me that he's coming back the second time as a man. So when did he give up this being a man thing and go back and take everything out of the safety deposit box? Well, he didn't. Are you telling me this is an eternal sacrifice? That he didn't just do this for 33 years? That God gave up every advantage he had as God forever? Yeah. That's his nature. Oh. I gotta have you. Whatever it costs. And I want to come to that and say, well, listen, I'll, I'll try it out and see if it works. <laughs> what? You want to come to that and say, I'll, I'll put my toe in the edge of the pond and see how it feels. What? There's no game with this, see. This is too big. The sacrifice is too great. Jesus, I feel it pulling on me. I feel you pulling on me. The absolute necessity of no game, no play acting, no trying, no messing around. I've got to be yours totally, absolutely, 100%. And I've got to let you do in me exactly what you want to do and take me out of everything that's connected with the demonic nature of grab, get, demand, protect, guard, and always think about myself. Oh God, save me from myself and give me the fullness of the integrated, relational, involved sponge welded, fused, integrated nature of God. What would happen if you were in my life like that? Forgive me, God, for the fits I throw. Forgive me, God, for the hate I harbor. Forgive me, God, when I get all upset and sit in the corner and suck my thumb. <laughs> Forgive me when I throw my three-year-old fits and beat my head on the wall. Forgive me, God, when I demand of you and you don't give it to me and I get mad. Forgive me, God, when I try to boss you around like you ought to do what I tell you. Forgive me, God, when I've sung, oh, to be like thee. And it was not true.
and God, I don't, I don't know where to go with this. Could you save me tonight from myself? And the rot, stench of my own self-righteousness. Heads are bowed. I can't talk to you anymore. I feel like he's pulling on me. Wanting to pull me into all he dreamed for me to be. If I just get out of his way.